Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. We create a capable diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, underrepresented populations and first generation to graduate high school and uh, go into the career fields or go to college into the education, employment, economic mobility and leadership pipeline. We do that in a number of different ways, one of which is we have an annual conference. This year is uh, in part virtual and maybe at some point also hybrid, but um, we, are, we are delighted to gather people uh, in person and virtually once a year. We also have um, inclusive leader awards. We also do a program called First Generation Leadership and we work with um, at least 100 every year. This year we're really opening that up because we are going to be virtual for our first gen students this year. And then we have some programs working with different college collaboratives around the country where we can track and measure the impact of our work in advising and student success and um, on the emotional, uh, mental, social health of students, as well as their uh, professional and career outlook. So we have a number of different uh, programs going on the next few weeks. Next week, we'll be celebrating educators. It's Teacher Appreciation uh, Day on Tuesday, but we'll be running programs all week for that. And the following week, we'll be doing a special uh, program celebrating our 2020 graduates. So uh, there are a number of things we're doing uh, from now until at least mid-June, and we're very glad you could join us. So today we're delighted to have Pat Partridge and his really timely topic, which is Mindset Matters the Most. How can we cultivate remarkably resilient learners at scale? So Pat Partridge is president of Western Governors University Academy, where he's responsible for the independent nonprofit entities operations and external relations. Pat received both of his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Virginia, earning his MBA from the Darden School of Business Administration in 1982. He spent several years in general management and entrepreneurial roles in cable television, wireless, and publishing, including general manager of two cable television operations, vice president of operations, and part owner of a private cable TV company. Prior to leading the WGU Academy, Partridge served as Chief Marketing Officer at Western Governors University, WGU, overseeing the university's marketing, public relations, enrollment, scholarship, alumni, and admissions departments. Beginning at WGU in 2002, when the university had about 400 students, he directed strategic marketing and enrollment programs that helped the university grow its online student body to over 115,000 students and more than 140,000 graduates in all 50 states. So we're delighted to have you here today, uh, Pat, on this really uh, timely topic. And I hope you will also be able to address the, the COVID circumstances. And you all have been doing this uh, online learning for a long time. So a lot of people who are joining today, I know don't have um, the background and they're just mm -hmm. having to pivot quickly into what you have a lot of expertise on uh, with all your folks at WGU. So thank you so much for joining us and we're really delighted to have you here with us. Okay, well, thank you. Um, now, do I need to take over the, the screen at this point? Yeah, and Lisa, we'll give that to Pat. So Pat, you're a co-host. You should be able to, are you not able to put your presentation up there? Well, I was just going to do a uh, say hello first before I put the presentation up there. First. But Great. I don't know if I'm... Uh, so... My, I'm on here, but I don't see... Yeah, we can see you full screen. So whoever talks and that pops up, so when okay. you speak, then you are. That's what I thought. So um, w welcome everyone. Um, we don't have a lot of time today uh, for what could be kind of a really rich discussion. Um, I am here in Utah and today it's a little bit sunny and I happen to have a um, clear story window up above my head and you can see the sun now being reflected off of my, my bald pate. So if you don't mind, I'm going to start by putting on a little hat 
that um, might take the glare off of my head so you can actually see a little better. But in a moment, we're gonna switch to the slideshow as well. Um, the, the wonderful uh, bio that, that Carol read was, I thought, rather extensive. I'm not sure my own children could have uh, given as much background about me as, as was in that bio. But um, I have been at WGU a very long time and watched the growth of online education and watch the growth of, of course, WGU itself. And over those years, WGU has learned a lot about how to interact with primarily adults who are pursuing it, uh, bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and, um, and models to actually help them deal with the challenges of being both a remote student, but in some cases being a, an individual who had struggled with education in the past. So I'm gonna be drawing from those lessons at WGU and then um, talking a little bit more about what we're doing at WGU Academy and how that grew out of some long experiences at WGU. So I'm gonna switch over right now and hope that we get the correct presentation up here. Does everybody see that okay? Good. So, um, let me start the slideshow. So I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by mindset as we go along and we'll kind of reveal it. Um, but what we really want to understand is, is what does that mean in terms of, of students, younger students, older students, um, in terms of ourselves as well. And I think you'll realize that there's, there's a lot about the, the concept of mindset that we have some assumptions about, but there are a couple of key things that when you understand those, you start to realize ways in which you can help individuals. So right now, now I'm having trouble advancing my slide not something I had trouble with before. So for a lot of individuals, even millions of individuals of all ages, they desire credentials beyond, beyond high school. But in many cases, they may personally, at that point in their life, lack academic skills, certainly confidence, tenacity, study habits that are going to hold them back. And as most of you know, the models that we've been operating under for the last two or three decades have been at best subpar. Uh, most remediation approaches have had pretty poor success rates and students will leave often demoralized, not believing in themselves, um, deeper in debt and without the market worthy credentials that they, that they need. Now, you probably know that remedial courses are across the whole gamut of undergraduate programs, as many as 68 or roughly two thirds of students in community colleges and a third of students in four year colleges often start with taking at least one remedial course. And often that results in at least an entire semester of remedial education. Less than 10% of those who are going into two year programs who start with remedial courses actually graduate within six years. Um, well, excuse me, within three years. And of those that are going into four-year programs, only about a third finish an undergraduate degree within six years. There's a tendency to believe that this is, that this is um, limited to certain ethnic groups. Anything, nothing can be further from the truth. It spans across all the different ethnic groups. There are some variations, but it's still a pretty significant problem that really needs to be addressed in new ways. So WGU Academy has worked on a new approach to college readiness that's low cost, low risk, that focuses on core academic skills and transferable courses, but more importantly, that focuses on the whole person and non-cognitive competencies and our model has a certain element of it that, that for us is scalable. And I'll come back to that um, as well later, later. The goal is remarkably resilient learners. So um, 
I'd really like to pause here and have you think about a, a moment about what we're talking about when we're talking about resilient learners. Because if you, if you think about it, you have most likely had success in academia. I don't know whether in your case that started when you were five years old or whether it came later. But the truth is, is that there are a lot of individuals for whom they have had a difficult time with, with learning from way back. And so the goal that we have is to develop remarkably resilient learners by really igniting the fire for learning, developing a sense of belonging, developing foundational academic preparedness, and to strengthen social and emotional skills that build resilience, to increase ownership, accountability, um, and to do so using coaching as part of that to personalize behavior change. So um, I want to delay here for a moment and, and give you some examples of, um, of where changing somebody's mindset mattered um, tremendously. And I was trying to think if I was going to, if we had time, I was going to detour over to some other slides, but maybe we'll do that at the end. But the research is really, really fascinating. For example, there are cases where students who have gotten a letter from academic advising that says, you know, you are going to be on probation. Um, you need to take care of this in order to, to stay off of probation versus not stay off of probation. And the same letter with some additional language in there that said, this is not unusual. You are not alone. You know, there are resources that can be done to help you develop, you know, these sort of competencies. The same letter and only that letter had a remarkable impact on the retention of those students over um, a year's time. And the reason was is that it reframed the, the, the negative in a way that still left room for growth. So when we talk about mindset, what we're really talking about is those kinds of inherent prejudices that individuals carry for themselves. It has to do with the questions we ask ourselves as students and even as mature, busy, COVID, you know, COVID corralled in, uh, adults. You know, there are a lot of things such as one is, am I good enough? Now, the first answer that most people get from that, if they're coming from a fixed mindset, is no. Their tendency to not believe in themselves, to believe that they are not good enough is it's oftentimes their starting point. Then if the, the question goes further and, and it becomes a question of, can I learn this material? Often the answer is, no, I don't have that ability, as if it's something that you possess. And, a, and by contrast, a growth mindset is one in which somebody has learned that there is still always room for progress. It does not mean that you will progress at the same pace as somebody else who has a different set of backgrounds and who has you know, both the confidence and perhaps the academic background that's stronger. But a growth mindset is one in which that individual believes. Now think about what happens when somebody gets a bad grade. An individual with a fixed mindset um, a person with a fixed mindset will believe that a D is an indication of failure, of certainly an F as well, but of, of having failed. And it's a reflection on their inherent abilities. Person with a growth mindset will instead look at that and say, I probably didn't do something right, i.e. I didn't study as hard as I needed to. I didn't understand something. I didn't ask for help when I needed it. There are a whole host of things that someone with a growth mindset would pursue as an alternative to thinking of it as failure. Now, I, I am, I, usually when I'm doing this in front of a presentation, this is an opportunity that I can't do as well today, but I ask you to think about yourself and be really brutally honest and ask yourself, how many cases do you believe in a fixed mindset. And I will tell you that most of us do. 
So if I were to ask you to raise your hand just so you're to yourself, so you don't have to let anybody else see is like, how many of you maybe think you have a fixed mindset about math? How many of you think you have a fixed mindset about musical ability? Notice the word ability as if this is something inherent. You may have a fixed mindset. Now, the truth is, is that you shouldn't. You could have a growth mindset even about things for which you have had difficulty in the past. Now translate that back to children and all the way up through adults. If as a child, you are getting a reinforcement of a fixed mindset, you are not good enough. A fixed mindset that, gee, I'm sorry, this seems to be harder than you're capable of doing. Those stories become ingrained and the fixed mindset becomes quite broad and very, very deeply rooted. That tr often transfers into individuals as they maybe later in life pursue college. And I'm not just talking about the 17 and 18 year olds, but the 28 and the 38 year olds can come into that with a fi fixed mindset about their capabilities, even though they are enrolling in college or enrolling in some kind of a certificate program where they have hope about what it can do for them, but still sitting underneath it are all of these elements of a fixed mindset. And, and the research clearly shows that if you, if you change, help individuals change that, that, that mindset of themselves, and at the same time, you wrap around it a cultural change that allows that person to prosper in a way that they are able to go further, you can really make some significant differences. So at WGU Academy, we drew upon a lot of experience at WGU to create a course essentially called the Program for Academic and Career Advancement or PACA. And what we've done in that is a relatively short period of time is to weave together some ways in which we go about trying to help transform students' belief systems about themselves, to help them develop a growth mindset, confidence, and a persistence. Um, we do that, and I'll go into a little more detail, with self-serve modules, small group inter sessions that are live, and one-to-one -one coaching. One of the things that you learn as you study deeper into the mindset um, research, and this is an interesting one for us to think about who have been parents or are currently parents with children of any age, is the concept of the importance of accepting some level of failure. And so failure has to be seen as a learning experience and something that you have to develop. That's where the resilience comes in. There's no need for resilience if everything is easy. Resilience comes in from learning how to manage and tackle things that are going to be difficult. And, um, and, and so difficulty is actually part of life and dealing with difficulty is a key to how you um, how you go for how you're able to prosper both in school and in life and in your career. So we actually have woven together these different domains or uh, in uh, this particular approach, this program that includes literally helping people practice mindfulness, having them learn and become self-aware, even down to some very simple breathing exercises that we believe or not we do but also happy, having them really understand what it means to set goals, to do actual planning of their life, not just time management, although that's part of it, and then to understand what a learning mindset is. And the learning mindset is one that accepts failure. So we do this with some self-serve modules, as I mentioned. These self-serve modules are specifically designed to help students concentrate on the effective and social emotional skills. And these are done so that they can be, um, and are typically done um, with individuals using their phones to do this. This allows for the student to have some personal reflection and to do these, this personal reflection before they then join into live sessions. The live sessions, which are usually hosted on Zoom, are ones that are led by a trained coach. 
Now, at w, if those of you know anything about WGU, we've got 20 years of having a mentoring model. But we also have a coaching model for a course that's known affectionately around here by its course number, of course, uh, C820. And C820 evolved from an earlier course. And C820 now is actually focused on WGU's huge RN to BSN program. And even with RNs, this course has been described as transformational. And I don't know if you know about RNs, they're pretty tough characters. And what it did, what it's been doing for these nurses is to help them understand themselves better and to reflect upon where they want to go in their careers, what it means to obtain their degree, et cetera. So we have actually had that course, which in some ways was a model for our PACA course. That course has actually been um, now offered to something like 40,000 students over the last seven years in our end BSN program. So back to the live sessions. Depending upon what module in PACA they're working on, or maybe more than one at the same time, these sessions allow for a kind of hyper bonding around these challenges. What we found is that the students, regardless of the age of the students in that group, so they're not all coming in at the same age, they're not all coming into the same degree program, but they do have a tendency to come in with, with some personal challenges. And what's nice is those who are further ahead in dealing in, in having a growth mindset or consistence, uh, uh, a persistence and grit, they often become, in effect, supportive coaches to those who are feeling more inclined to struggle, who are feeling like this may be hard for them. And so this, these live sessions have a way of allowing people to see that they're not alone, and not only not alone that there are people like them, but they're not alone in the sense that there is a small group that they will interact with. So in the current version of PACA, there are seven live sessions, sometimes two a week, sometimes one a week, but it's also backed up with live one-on-one -on -one coaching. Our coaches go through a pretty extensive training um, on a particular technique called motivational interviewing. Some of you on the call may be familiar with that. It's one of the techniques that's um, approved by the International Coaching Federation. And it's designed to actually personalize what they're learning about themselves and allow them to reinforce um, their determination. There are ways in which some of the topics that are done in one-on-one -on -one coaching can also be done in kind of group coaching sessions, which is also something that we're doing. So, oh, I, I, was, I didn't realize this version allowed me to play that. So, um, sorry we don't have time. You would have, many of you on the call would have found it interesting to hear the, the interactions between um, the student and the coach. So, what is the difference between coaching and mentoring? Coaching is very personal. It's about creating a safe environment, whether individually or in these small groups, it helps empower choice, it helps individuals grow their sense of self-efficacy and to actually understand the relationship between their kind of wishes, goals, and what it actually will take to get there. Um, there's like an ancient saying that if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. Um, meaning they would have, a horse would always be available to them if it was just a wish. Um, it actually takes work. Mentoring, on the other hand, is a bit more focused on a kind of a providing a guidance. Now, it's, it's interesting to think about in typical higher ed settings where these kind of roles fall. In many cases, what advising departments at community colleges or four-year colleges often do is a little bit more mentoring because it's actually difficult to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Either they don't have the training or they're just the schedule, the busyness of it all makes that really challenging. And so the mentoring is sort of designed to provide a, a, a quick structure to allow the student to understand what it takes. And it might say, hey, go take this course on um, persistence or even go watch this video on growth mindset, all of which have real value. But the, the power of coaching is that you can let students sort of do some bonding among themselves guided by a trained coach. So um, I don't wanna go too much into selling where, what we're doing with PACA. I'm really wanting to use that as a framework 
of how to think about this. And I hope we have a chance to talk a little bit more about some other elements of um, mindset and, and what it what matters. Um, we call it our secret sauce. Um, generally speaking, when we survey our students continuously, roughly four out of five consistently say that they think it will contribute to their future academic success and future professional success. And I need to explain that for us, the individuals who are coming into this program have either never attempted higher ed or have attempted it and failed. And while their ages might range from 17 or 18, um, in general, these are older adults and they've been out of school for a long time and they carry with them into an online environment um, a, lot of, a lot of fear. So the Academy, as, as um, Carol mentioned, is actually independent in many, many ways of big WG is what I call it. And so we really are kind of a startup within the organization. And our first customer is in fact WGU. Um, so we succeed through others and our goal is to expand access to underprepared and underserved students um, through low risk and, low, and lower cost approaches. We have more than one approach to helping students become engaged and finish and try to do this in a very affordable way. Um, our goal is to work with partners across the education spectrum who share similar missions. As I mentioned, our first partner is actually WGU. So with WGU, what we're basically doing is we're getting referrals of individuals who were not admitted to WGU. Uh, most of those, as I said, are with no prior college. And what we do is we align courses at, that we have at, at the academy with WGU programs and provide a smooth transition back to WGU, in effect, a guaranteed admission. We're also partnering with others, such as community colleges and universities. Um, working with what might fit into their needs with college readiness solutions. Um, also employers and community organizations. We just are now kicking off a small pilot with a county community organization that's helping to develop, um, trying to create a transition for fairly young adults who have never been to college and who struggled in high school and so we are, this is a partnership with WGU to serve a small number of students supported by this county uh, community organization. So that's an example. And in some cases, there are employers for whom we may end up being a solution for their employees who have not been um, down the path of post-secondary credentials and the academy becomes, if you will, an on, that on-ramp to get them started. Um, we are exploring um, the possibility of working with high school students, most likely seniors, possibly in a dual enrollment model, but more than anything, just helping to um, develop their resilience. So as I mentioned, WGU, um, we actually built a separate website called WGU Academy for our work with WGU. And last summer, we did our first external partnership with the Tennessee Achieves, which supported the Tennessee Promise scholarships, working with Tennessee, a small number, 20 Tennessee Promise Scholarship um, awardees who had scored at the 50th percentile on the ACT or lower um, to try to help them develop some grit and resilience. So um, the next slide is actually a little bit out of date. We launched last May 1, so we are exactly one year old. We have actually served over 6,000 students already. Um, our goal is to get to as many as a thousand students a month. Um, so we believe in the worth of individuals and we believe in potential. Now, granted, all of us know that the range of success that individuals have in academia is wide. And so we don't profess that we will have the next Einstein come out of the academy. But we do believe in the concept that individuals should be given every opportunity including the opportunity to develop themselves personally, to develop their resiliency, and to develop that kind of uh, skill set that's in that non-cognitive, metacognitive, social and emotional domain that will help them succeed. So I kind of 
went through a short version of this. Um, I'm, I think we'll probably have an opportunity to take questions. I am not, because of the slideshow setup, I'm not aware of what questions may have been in the chat. So I'm going to end the show right here. Um, I hope. get off of stop sharing um, and come back to this. And as far as I'm concerned, Carol, we can unmute people or people can raise their hand, um, however you might like to do it as far as asking questions. And sure. I, I wanna take time to talk more about mindset generally um, mm -hmm. and see where I can answer those kinds of questions. Yeah, really the easiest way to do it is if you all can go ahead right now, and put your questions in the chat. It's um, easier to kind of take those things one by one. And uh, then we can go through, you know, questions and comments and then Pat can be responding to your specific issues and things that come up. So let's just um, take a minute and um, allow for that. And uh, we also can, um, you know, open it up to a couple of people who want to speak as well, if that's easier. So we'll see what comes in the chat. And then we can also see who else um, has some specific issues about ways in which they might model some of the things you all have done um, and uh, be able to work with their particular situations. Yeah. And I, I, uh, while we're doing that, while we're getting some questions um, and uh, is to actually, um, I'll talk a little bit about the sort of mindset uh, movement, if you will. Um, it actually has a, a deeper roots and data from, in some ways, the K-12 arena than it does in higher ed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that might come from a, a misunderstanding that, that we tend to believe that 18-year-olds are adults and we're supposed to be treated like adults. And, but one of the points I was really trying to get at is that all of us as adults, we still have issues around a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. In fact, one of the really interesting observations, in fact, I should say uh, research studies, would actually show that when you knew the mindset of a faculty member, if that faculty member had a growth mindset or if that faculty member had a fixed mindset, and there are ways to find that out, that the actual student performance as measured objectively of the faculty member who has a growth mindset will be better than the student performance of faculty members who have a fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. So it has subtle ways in which that has an impact on performance that are very hard for us to kind of um, put, into, put into buckets. And I, I can't tell you how many thousands of graduates at WGU in their late 20s and 30s who are getting their bachelor's degree from the first time in very, very in often emotional testimonials will tell us no one believed in me when I was younger. Mm -hmm. They believed I was not capable. And so the fixed mindset that had been passed down to them and somehow later in life they had enough desire to at least break through that and work their way back into higher education and becoming, you know, become WGU graduates in these amazingly emotional graduation ceremonies that we have because we at WGU believe in them. Well, and, and Pat, and which is awesome. And we believe with Global Minded that we can be a, a larger network and that the more you have large networks, so that WGU is a network, any institution is a network, and then other organizations like Global Minded can provide those, you know, those larger networks. One of the questions, let me just go into these real quick so I can share with you. And we've got a mixed audience. So we've got some K-12 folks right. here. Um, uh, let me just uh, go to the first question was about how do you promote, you know, conceptual uh, thinking? And, uh, and, and a lot of this is, is, um, you know, they're, they're asking also for other resources, Carol Dweck and other kinds of things where they could learn more. And then um, somebody also asked from um, one of the most important things I learned in college, this is a middle school teacher, was that college was about conceptual thinking, about the facts and not all just facts. How do you teach students to think conceptually or theoretically? Okay, so that's the same. 
that's the uh, same person, that's Phil Hanna. And then we'll go to the next person who um, is asking for more resources for growth mindset and social and emotional learning. Yeah, let, let, me, let me address that last one about resources first. Um, the, my short answer is I'm really bad at remembering names of websites, et cetera. So if, um, if that person or anyone else wants um, to get further resources on social and emotional learning and mindset, um, have them send an email to me directly. I'll put together a list and so I can send that out um, as a collection. It might include a couple of of um, articles or references to articles, maybe an attachment or something like that. So my email address is just p partridge, so it's pat part, but or pat dot partridge, but it's p partridge like the bird at wgu.edu if you're looking for resources. So it might take me a few days. I'll wait till I see if I have a couple of people, and then I'll put together some resources and and send them out. Yeah, um, I think that the question about conceptual. Excuse me. I just said that would be great. So, yeah. Um, it's funny. I have them in all different places. I have a kind of research library where I go and park articles, and some of them are websites that are pretty good. Um, and um, the, the um, and, and I think it was somebody that was on the K twelve side that asked that that was looking for those resources. So I want to make sure that I include the links to resources that are that are kind of covering the K twelve arena as well. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I want to be clear that I am I am not um, an expert on all aspects of academia and uh, pedagogy. So the question about conceptual thinking is one that we actually deal with at WGU broadly all the time. Um, and it kind of sort of depends. And I read these arguments about whether or not mastery of facts is helpful for conceptual thinking versus um, not. I happen to believe that certain level of mastery of facts actually helps you make associations, which therefore helps you with conceptual thinking. Um, but there is a lot of controversy or at least uh, ch ch chatter around that sort of distinction. Um, when we start talking about resiliency, what is interesting is that you don't get there until the student develops some awareness. And, and in, in a weird sort of way, it is a conceptual understanding of oneself. Um, because it, up until that point, people believe these things about themselves. And so I, we, I like to think that the student who's coming even out of just our PACA course is, you know, in a position where they are able to kind of realize that, that pausing and thinking and reflecting, reflecting, um, are skills that are going to help them in these other kinds of courses. But I am not an expert on um, the general topic of conceptual uh, pedagogy. I, 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 I can tell you, um, it was interesting, we did a follow-up after one semester of the students who were at um, these Tennessee community colleges that had come to us last summer. And we went and interviewed all of them at the end of their first semester and, and basically said, how did it go? And what was interesting was that different students took away different things from their experience in the PACA course. A couple of them literally said the breathing exercise really was helpful because I struggle with anxiety when things are not going well and I learned how to slow down and breathe. Another one was sort of took that further and said, I learned how powerful it was to just be mindful of my own emotions and how I was feeling about school because I also had something going on at home and I had a part-time job and my car, you know, all these things that get in the way of students succeeding. Um, others basically said, I really liked the idea of learning how to plan and manage my time in the framework of what, it, what mattered to me. So the connection between time planning, strategic planning, time management and their goals. Um, Others were, I didn't do very well in this course, but I know I will next semester. I feel like I'm still got it. So those are the ones that like really warm your heart is they did not succeed and still have a sense of grit to carry them forward. They know that it's possible. And you know, that belief in knowing that it's possible is, is so powerful. Um, I mean, that's Frankly, right now, many of us have days when we're kind of bleak. You know, we don't have all of our emotions lining up 
like we've had them lined up for the last five years. And you do have to be reflective. You have to think about these are the things that are going on in my life. These are the things to be thankful for. Here's how I'm going to tackle these problems. And mm -hmm. the people on this call are by nature more resilient than the kind of individuals I'm talking about serving. And yet, you know, it's hard. So, um, you know, well, anyway. I think too, Pat, one of the things we really have to acknowledge is that the population that we serve is disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, environmentally, health, some of them technology insecure. I mean, there's so many pieces of things that are spinning because COVID is revealing so many different inequities. And um, <clears throat> so I think, um, you know, the more that students are able to, to really ground in, you know, the, what's on the other side of this um, disaster, however this sets them back and loss of family members they love, some of them have this themselves, you know, just um, dealing in the realities of all of that, um, I think is, is really key. And, you know, the people that have showed up today, I think are, are really grateful for your guidance, you know, on that type of thing as well. So, um, you know, so um, we, we have about 3000 current students at the academy and um, growing a little bit every day. And we, um, our students can actually start every day at WGU Academy. So um, we actually have new students that will start today and tomorrow, et cetera. But in any case, over the last um, six weeks or so, um, I started a series of letters to our students. And each of those letters was trying to um, let them know that we cared and provided a resource. And one of the interesting um, weaknesses of people that have a, a fixed mindset or are struggling is they're not good at help seeking. They mm -hmm. actually think of help seeking as a weakness, or at least they have no, no history of it. Maybe because they didn't get help, but also because they were shy, what, any number of things. And so one of the things I've been encouraging the students in my weekly letter is often things like, don't forget to seek help. Reach out to your academy coach. Reach out to another student maybe that you've met through PACA. More importantly, family and friends who support your, you know, your education goals. And then of course, I'm basically reminding them, you have a long-term goal still you know, don't throw in the towel, give yourself a chance. And this is not about what's good for WGU, but it's just reminding them, because we know that, that you still have to hold on to your long-term objectives. Um, last week's message was, was much more lighthearted, but at the same time, very serious, which was, here comes the sun, you know, let the sun shine in. Um, it's springtime, you know, um, and, and simple lessons like, your long-term goal is there one step at a time and just take small steps. And I, I do think that there's a, um, a, a going to be a need across higher ed and K-12 education to actually get down and help students feel connected to a brighter future and mm -hmm. not live off of the negative stories that they're hearing or reading or being told. And that's challenging. That will be a challenge for all of us. Um, but that's certainly my approach, which is, you know, um, we, you know, we know it's hard. It, it, it's interesting when, when WGU did some research and multiple times now about which students drop and which students succeed. One of the things that was a really core and super simple lesson to take away was that life happens is the reason why students drop. They have money issues, somebody got sick in the family, they personally got sick, they may have lost a job. What actually the research showed that was more important was all of those same things happened to our graduates. In other words, if you're an adult, over the span of two or three years, it's pretty likely that you're going to have a fairly significant life challenge. The difference between the individuals who went ahead and the ones who dropped and the ones who succeeded was not the degree of what happened to them in their life. It was the determination they had, their resilience, and the support that they had. So do not assume that by fixing the underlying issue like, and, or let, and or treating that like a legitimate excuse, 
we all have legitimate excuses for not doing things, including really serious excuses. But that does not mean that we should give up on people because they have a good excuse for dropping. If anything, yeah. we need to have people understand that something being hard is worth pursuing. And sometimes, you know, it might take longer, maybe more painful, but it's still worth pursuing. So it was yeah. an interesting lesson at WGU is that the difference between our students who dropped and the students who graduated was almost nil. So Pat, let me get to another question sure. for you. So this is a woman from uh, Dillard University and uh, she's thinking through the embedding um, across the different um, campus cultures. And she says that as the lead in this effort, she hadn't considered embedding the philosophy into the messages such as about probation. Um, what else can you share about that particular idea? And then we got a couple more questions. So if you can get that, and, and then we got about five or six minutes. So I know I'm going to see if I can pull up um, that. Um, you guys bear with me for a second. Um, that's not it. Um, I'm going to share something from a colleague of mine. Um, maybe. <laughs> can you still hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, where is that? Um, people are also asking, is this fully online distance learning environment? Uh, their community college has to move from asking students, are you ready for online learning to let's get ready because we're all learning online. So, and, and I think the answer is yes, you guys are fully and have been from the beginning uh, fully online, right, Pat? Uh, yes, we have a couple of uh, programs where individuals um, we have a couple of programs where individuals have to do field work for, um, in, but in general, uh, for example, we have a, we have the largest teachers college in the country and our teachers still do their demonstration teaching or field teaching in actual classrooms, you know, during mm -hmm. the term, but most everything else before that, other than some observations are done online. So um, we have been all online for 23 years now. Okay. Um, so I think, can you see my screen? It's always hard to know what can and can't be yeah, seen. It says the program for academic and career advancement. So it's the PACA, looks like overview. Ah, okay, I'm not getting the one I wanted. So that's okay. just because I had too many possibilities. No worries, we can um, actually include those, Pat, in some of the reference materials that we can share with people following. So okay, um, don't worry about that. I'm just gonna go back to the chat, see so, if there's So any. let me go back to, let me go back to the example of the person from Dillard Ask and talking about the letter. So there was, this was literally the, the example of a letter that says, you know, we are committed to the academic success of all of our undergraduates. We also recognize success is not always achieved along a predictable path. Placement on academic probation is part of the university's commitment to offer students support for and guidance through whatever difficulties they may, they may have experienced. To this end, you must meet as soon as possible, but not later than May 13th with an academic advisor, blah, blah, blah. blah. So I'm actually, that letter sounds pretty reasonable, but, but there are th the same letter changed said, we also understand that success is not always achievable in a predictable path. There are many reasons students enter the academic probation process. These reasons can include personal, financial, health, family, or other issues. Our goal is to help you identify the factors that are relevant to you and to help you address them. You should also know that you are not alone in experiencing these difficulties. Mm -hmm. And then later on, it goes on to talking about for descriptions of the experiences of some past students who have gone through this process, please see the attached documents, students' perspectives on the probation process. And then it talks about the process for academic probation. In other words, the first letter sounded like, we care about you, you gotta meet with us. This second version of it acknowledged without knowing the specifics, that there are lots of other kinds of things that, that are, can be more personal, that are contextual. It helped the person know getting the letter 
really reframe it as in, oh, they get me a little bit more. I'm not mm -hmm. just a failure. So there's some very subtle uh, differences. And in this particular case, one year later, the, the students still enrolled getting that standard letter was 48%. Those who got the revised letter was at 79%. And this was in a controlled wow. test. Wow. That, that um, just shows that, you know, the language matters. It's, it's like that Frank Luntz book, right? It's not what you say, it's what people hear. Yes. Um, there's, there's another example where, you know, you, if a student um, gets a letter that says an, a, a lot of red on their paper, and even the professor says, you know, I just, I, want, I just wanted to give you some feedback that will help you get better. That's one. They did a test where they just changed the note to saying, I'm giving these comments because I have high standards and I know you can meet them. Mm. So the feedback was brutal. I'm looking at this paper with red marks all over it. Mm -hmm. The first feedback was perfectly fair. It's nothing particularly cruel about it. But the second one included a, I have high standards and you can meet them. And in fact, one of the things about understanding the importance of resilience is to allow people to not make excuses, you know, to, to not make excuses to themselves. Um, because th there's no end to the extent to which we're all capable of, of making excuses. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. So we are at time, but I would like to say if anybody else has uh, some other questions, uh, someone just said, wow, that was amazing. Somebody from Hawaii who was with us yesterday. Um, I want to you. invite you all. Pat's email is on the chat and he's been very gracious uh, with his time today. And I know he's looking forward to uh, receiving any other questions from you all um, that has been um, ignited from his session. I also just wanna share that we have a number of different events we're doing, especially for COVID-19 programming with teachers, with students. And uh, next week, if you happen to be a K-12 or a college faculty person, we're doing a whole series of events celebrating educators, that's counselors, that's advisors, that's faculty, that's K-12 teachers, really anybody involved in a lot of parents right now who are at home managing their jobs and also being the teachers. So we have that going on. And the week of May 11th, we have something called Celebrating 2020 Graduates. These are graduates that could be from middle school, from high school, from college. We know that those grads got uh, short shrift this year and we wanna be there to support them with our diverse and inclusive community through Global Minded with um, graduation speeches, our young professionals, panels of um, people who are first gen who graduated who are now out in different careers and um, very much looking forward to working with you all on that. So thank you for joining us and uh, continue to look for these kinds of events in our newsletter and we also have um, an event happening at noon today on um, AR and VR and how we can help students become digital citizens uh, and be really connecting to their passions around this time as a way to find the strength and the resilience that Pat um, spoke of and the self-advocacy and all of those other um, abilities of wherewithal. So uh, Pat, thank thanks you, again Carol. so much. Carol, thank you. I, I did want some people still are on. Um, you know, if, if you can, um, yeah. I'm happy to let you unmute everyone. And, you bet. Uh, they so let us tell you guys. Unmute themselves and, you bet. Um, We've been doing, uh, we'll stop the recording and then we'll um, create a safe space for you all to really brainstorm with Pat. We've been doing that through some other sessions. So it's not going to be recorded and we want you to be able to um you know just have some some time to get some support yourself we know you guys are all balancing a lot of different stresses and um so for the next 10 or 15 minutes feel free to be able to do that with pat um in your own time and you can just un unmute your mic and um and ask questions or use the chat whatever is easier and uh, we'll be doing that for like the next